Hey guys, the video for class didn't exactly record the way I needed it to, so I'm just going to do a quick uh, record here. Uh, we are on to week 12 of the class. In week 12, we're going to cover chapter 5. Right now, I have uh, chapter 5 penciled in for two weeks, but I'm thinking we may add a third week just because of some, th some of the hands on things I want to try to do um, in class. Um, chapter 5 is all about mobile security. So we get into things like wireless, Bluetooth, and then mobile devices like cell phones, um, tablets, and then our laptops. So just uh, going to go through a few slides here. Not going to go through them all. But the objectives for Chapter 5, um, after Chapter 5, you should be able to describe some attacks using Wi-Fi and Bluetooth networks explain the different types of attacks on the mobile devices, list some defenses for a home Wi-Fi network, describe how you can um, get onto a public, public wireless network a little bit more securely, and list some types of security we can use for our mobile devices. Um, the reason why this is such a big topic is because users are using their uh, mobile devices much more than they are their desktops nowadays. Uh, back in 2008, I think the book says, 80% of user activity was done on a desktop computer. Um, I mentioned in class I can't even think of the last time I used a desktop computer. It's been a, it's been a little while. So uh, four out of five searches are actually done on the web using some type of mobile device. So it's everywhere. Um, that's what people want. They want to be able to have information at their fingertips. They want to be mobile. They want to be able to roam around and uh, still have access to all of their resources. So because of this, wireless networks have become a prime target for attackers. Uh, one of the main attacks is attempting to capture unprotected wireless signals. If they can uh, see what's happening on the network, this just opens up a whole new av avenue for these attackers. Um, there are several different types of uh, mobile device attacks that we'll talk about here. Um, but typically how they get, in, get inside of uh, the mobile devices they're directing the attacks towards the wireless networks because that's how we're connecting our mobile devices is through some type of wireless technology whether it's Wi-Fi or whether it's uh, Bluetooth so the next part of the chapter gets into to, gets into some of the different um, types of wireless networks that we encounter using a mobile device uh, first is Wi-Fi and a lot of this is kind of a, a repeat of my hardware class or my networking class if you're in that uh, but if you're not, it's, it's a good read, and it's always a good recap if you are in those classes. Uh, but a Wi-Fi network is going to use uh, radio frequency transmission to send our signals back and forth. Since it's using radio frequency transmission, you know, anybody can freely pick up that signal. Anybody within range can pick up those signals, um, making it uh, a security vulnerability. Who developed the uh, wireless standards is uh, known as the IEEE, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers they use the 802.11 standard and within the 802.11 standard that are there are different forms there's the 802.11 B, uh, B, A, G and an A, C. I'll focus on the N and the A, C here like I did in class uh, because those are probably the two most popular if you go down to you know Best Buy Office Depot, Depot or Staples and you're gonna buy a new wireless router uh, you're probably gonna be either buying an A, C device or an N device. Um, N can operate at the 2.4 or the 5 gigahertz range where the AC is strictly at the 5 gigahertz. Uh, the 5 gigahertz can go much faster because of the higher frequency and also um, the AC will use more antennas to send and receive. Uh, but since it's using 5 gigahertz it can't go quite as far as far as the distances. So if we look at the speed 7.2 giga, uh, gigabits per second but the distance is only 115 feet that's indoors. The 802.11n at the 2.4 um, gigahertz can go up to 230 feet. Um, at the five, at the 2.4, it's actually limited to 150 megabits per second. Um, <clears throat> but sending or receiving, I should say, so 300 total. Uh, but five gigahertz range can go up to 600 megabits. That's 300 sending or 300 receiving. And um, with that, you know, we're not going to be able to go uh, quite as far with the five gigahertz versus the 2.4. Uh, the outdoor range is much higher, and that's because we don't have things like walls and um, other um, barriers that we're trying to penetrate through. 
Uh, there's also an 802.11 AD that the networking curriculum gets into, but the book does not mention that. Um, it's important to understand the differences between these uh, because as you're searching for networks and as you're connecting and as you're looking at wireless devices such as adapters or routers, uh, they're going to be advertised with these standards and you'll want to know what the difference is between the two or three or four or five depending on what you're, what you're finding. But the main two you'll see right now is the N and the AC. Uh, wireless networks are pretty easy to set up. There's not a whole lot of equipment that's needed. There's essentially three things that need to be put into place. Uh, one is a wireless adapter, so some type of wireless network card, and almost all of our mobile devices are going to have that built in. Uh, the second is you need some software to translate between the device and the adapter. Uh, luckily this is included with all the operating systems today, so really there's nothing to need, need to do there either. And then the third is you need a broadband router. That broadband router is our gateway, our default gateway. It's our gateway out to the internet and our remote networks. It basically sends and receives our wireless signals. Um, a typical home-based router is actually a, a multi-purpose device because it has a built-in switch for wired communication, and then it has the Wi-Fi antenna for our wireless communication. Um, <coughs> they, all com they come in a variety of shapes and sizes, but if you're a mid-continent um, customer, what you're leasing from them, if you are leasing from them, probably looks very similar to this. Oh, the other day in class, I had students uh, draw up their picture of what their home wired or what their home network looks like, and many of them looked very similar to this. We had some wired devices, we had some wireless devices, but at the heart of it, we had that wireless router typically. Uh, besides a wireless router in a more corporate business type environment, you have access points more sophisticated than a router. Uh, these are actually hardwired um, back to a router or to a switch. So you can think of these as like a wireless switch. Um, in class, if we wanted to connect everybody together wired, uh, we would take a cable and we'd connect it back to a switch. In a wireless network, if we want to connect everybody, everybody would connect back to the same access point. Um, <clears throat> Typically, there'll be multiple access points set up, and this is allows this allows you to to roam from uh, you know one building to the next, or from one room to the next. And for some reason in class, I kept calling this um, handcuffing. Um, it's just actually hand hand handing off or doing a handoff from one access point to the next. Um, I use the example um, in class. You know, here on campus, uh, if you're walking from the tech center where class is at over across the street to the student union. When you get to the street, you're going to be um, handed off to a um, access point that's over in that union because now you're closer to that. Uh, I think in class I said you're going to be handcuffed at the street. I should have said you're going to be handed off um, at the street to a different access point because now it's closer to you. And that's going to be considered uh, your new base station because it's closest to you. So you're not going to be you know, communicating with the access point still in the tech center, even though you can faintly pick up that signal, you're going to be communicating with your new base station um, over in the student union because now you're closer to it and have a better signal. Um, this is important because, you know, as an attacker, you want to see where people are being handed off and you want to see where they're getting their traffic sent to. Um, and if you want to try to impersonate one of those access points, you have to kind of keep that in mind. So there are some different attacks on Wi-Fi. Um, one is reading wireless transmission. Because wireless transmission is open and anybody can freely see that signal, being able to sniff that uh, traffic can be relatively easy, especially in the case of an unsecured network or a network that has an um, unsecured protocol or a protocol that's weak, like WEP. Uh, viewing and stealing computer data. Um, since you can connect to a home network easily, sometimes people have things that are shared out on that network that they don't even realize. In class, I mentioned the public folder sharing that used to be turned on by default in Windows. Um, I tried to turn it on in class, but I don't think I got all the way there. Let me just look here. Um, no, it's not showing the public folders, but anything inside of those public folders uh, would be shared out automatically. And if you can connect to the network, you can connect to that share and now you basically have a gateway or avenue into that, that PC. Um, injecting malware. It says because an attacker might access the network behind a firewall, they could um, inject Trojan viruses and other malware onto the user's computer. Because <clears throat> now they're into the network 
Um, they could intercept traffic, kind of do a man-in-the-middle attack that's being sent. Intercept traffic, replay it out on the network with some malware and, and injecting it out onto the onto the wireless network. <clears throat> Another one kind of goes um, in with the uh, war driving here, but if you can connect to a wireless network that is insecure or um, has a um, open standard set to it, so basically no no good encryption on it. Um, you can now do malicious activity on that network. Um, <clears throat> I gave the example of you know people connecting to wireless networks that are open and um, disseminating child pornography or disseminating viruses. And now when the authorities catch wind of this and, and see this, it's tied back to the person that owned the wireless network because uh, they don't know that it was somebody sitting in the in the driveway or the parking lot actually accessing the Wi-Fi. They only know that it was coming from this wireless network, this IP address, and whoever owned that um, is responsible for for that data and responsible for locking down their wireless network. So you don't want to have open um, networks out there. You don't want to have networks using WEP if you're using um, that type of that type of encryption. It's just not safe. <clears throat> I then showed in class uh, a video on on war dr war driving. Uh, if you go to YouTube and you do a search for war driving with professional hackers, uh, I won't show this in this video just for time's sake, uh, but what this does is it shows uh, a couple of guys driving around um, looking for um, either open networks or web networks and uh, how quick and easy it is to crack a, a web network. Kind of get into some reasons on uh, you know why it's not secure and how they developed it. Uh, but they're still seeing it out there. This video is a little bit older, um, but you know, as he says in the video, people just don't realize that they're not secure. They um, fire up their brand new uh, router or access point. It doesn't have encryption turned on by default, and uh, now they have you know an unsecure network that anybody can access. Uh, I'm another attack that I got into is the evil twin. In that video I just mentioned, he also gets into the evil twin a little bit. Essentially what they're doing is kind of uh, spoofing a network. In the video he mentioned Arby's and I think Starbucks. Essentially what, what he's talking about doing is starting up a wireless network or starting up a new SSID that has the, the same network name. So you fire up a wireless router called Arby's, you make it open and unsecured, when people are uh, in Arby's, they connect to it. They think they're actually connecting to Arby's network, but they're not. They're connecting to this evil twin or this uh, fake wireless network. Now that attacker can grab all of the traffic that's going to it. So you need to be um, aware of what you're connecting to and um, what you're sending out on those, on those networks if they are uh, public types of networks. And we'll get into some of the defenses um, next week. Uh, Bluetooth is mentioned as well. Since Bluetooth is a common networking technology, um, we see it very often with our mobile devices. It's more of a pairing or connectivity type of protocol, but you can still send and receive files and whatnot using uh, Bluetooth. It does have a lot shorter range, only 10 meters compared um, to the lo lot further distances of our Wi-Fi. Only one megabit per second for the transmission rate. But there's basically two attacks that are mentioned in the curriculum on Bluetooth. One is uh, bluejacking, and bluejacking is more of a nuisance. Basically, you are sending up information, you're pushing up information to the Bluetooth-enabled device, maybe a text message or um, some type of um, annoying or some type of annoying thing that's happening over and over um, to the user, maybe images or sounds or something. There's also blue snarfing. Uh, blue snarfing, you're actually pulling down information from the Bluetooth-enabled device. So this is a, a little bit more malicious, a little bit more be, a little bit more to be concerned about with blue snarfing. Uh, maybe you're connecting to the Bluetooth device to um, maybe copy emails or download their calendar or, or possible information that's on their phone, like uh, pictures or something. So the blue snarfing, we need to be be aware of and um, again we'll talk about some defenses with that next week. 
Uh, the chapter then gets into some different types of mobile devices. I don't know that we need to get into all of these and characterize them. I think we've all probably used laptops, sub notebooks before. Um, one thing I will mention that's often overlooked because it's still relatively new is the wearable technology. Um, Fitbits, iWatches, those sorts of things that are becoming more and more mainstream. They're basically mini computers. They have their own operating system. They have the Bluetooth protocol or Wi-Fi um, <coughs> installed and it uh, can be an avenue in which an attacker um, can take is to go after the, the wearable technology. Um, it also gets into how mobile devices basically um, access applications. That's um, what people use a lot of their devices for is to download apps, to use those apps for a variety of reasons. It could be something as simple as um, you know, uh, an application to um, record video or audio. It could be an application to edit a picture. It could be an application like uh, Facebook or Snapchat. Uh, but these applications um, typically don't contain a whole lot of security features. Some are better than others. Um, <clears throat> with these applications, usually we'll, we will get them from a reputable site um, like the Google Play Store or the Apple um, App Store. But if you, are have, if you have a jailbroken or rooted phone, now you're probably sideloading these applications um, from unreputable sites and you're not getting them from the stores. So with that, you, you are more susceptible to, to those risks. Um, in the book, it talks about in a six-month span, there was 350,000 um, different malicious um, app applications uploaded to the... Um, or put out there on the Android market. I shouldn't say uploaded to Google Play Store. But 350,000 applications in a six month period um, that basically were malicious in intent. Uh, many of those um, were imitations of legitimate popular apps or they were actually Trojans. 44% of those were designed to trick users into downloading um, costly services. Um, programs they didn't need, malware defenders that they didn't need. Another 24% were designed to steal um, data and another 17% were designed to load adware. Um, I then mentioned in class um, about I think a, a year, maybe even longer ago, um, a lot of the mainstream media caught on to a story about uh, how the flashlight applications in Android and I think the Apple Store too uh, were were developed by like um, Russian hackers, and they were like the top three downloads. And what what doing or what downloading that flashlight application would do is it would give that attacker complete control over your phone. Almost and they had access to your contacts, to your pictures, to your microphone, um, all these different things that uh, that application gave permission to over the phone. Um, and what they said is, you know the application for something like that should never be really larger than um, than a few megabytes in size. Uh, but it was just an interesting story to um, kind of shed some light on you know what we're talking about. Unfortunately I wasn't able to find it um, on, on YouTube. I uh, didn't have enough time to, to track it down but uh, if you do happen to to find it uh, let me know and, and share it. I'll try to spend some more time to track it down here as well. But um, just an interesting uh, news story I thought that was relevant to what we're talking about today. Other risks associated with our mobile devices, we have very limited physical security, very small in nature. Um, we can throw them in our pocket, throw them on our dashboard, um, easy to lose. Um, you know, you're not just going to be dragging around a desktop, so uh, that makes the physical security on a desktop just that much better where we don't have that with our mobile devices. Sensor mobile, a lot of times we're connecting to public public networks, that's what people want. So if you go to restaurants, stores, they always have these public networks that people can connect to. Um, you know, I've even seen now if you go to a baseball or football game in these large stadiums, they have free Wi-Fi available. Well, that just, uh, you know, is a perfect prime, um, <clears throat> a perfect prime spot for uh, an attacker to eaves eavesdrop and gather some information and start sniffing packets. Also location tracking is typically turned on on these devices making it more susceptible 
to a target, targeted physical attack because they know exactly where you're located. Um, accessing untrusted content. Uh, one example of this was uh, QR codes. With some of the QR codes, um, they're doing different things like um, playing a file. Um, they could be sending you to a website. They could be uh, pulling up a phone number. They could be sending you text messages. There's a variety of things you can do with a, with a QR code. And at that point, I had the class in the doc sharing do this QR code challenge. Just had them um, take a look at a few QR codes. With this, you'd need a smartphone or a tablet uh, that has a camera, and then you need a QR code reader. And then I had them um, scan these QR codes and perform the functions or see what they were all about with those. So if you wanted to do that um, at home or as an online student, you definitely can. There is one here, though, where you would not be able to do that. Um, what they did is when you scan, or what happened is when you scanned this QR code, it had them walk down and inside the building and find another one. These were by the pop machines, and then by the pop machines, there was another QR code that said, um, you found it, come back to class. The last QR code I had them scan was a note about Wednesday's class. Um, I will be out of town, so any of my classes on Wednesday are not going to meet. You may have saw the email that I sent out about Kali Linux. Um, for class next week, we're going to try to uh, hack WEP or crack the WEP protocol, just like they kind of do in this video. We'll see if we can't get that going in, in the class. And in order to do that, you need the Kali Linux program. So. Um, Check out that email that I sent. It should give you some direction as far as um, installing what you need for class that day. Uh, that's about it for uh, this video. Um, again, sorry the actual video didn't work in class very well, but uh, this hopefully went through all the information that, that you need. So um, we'll see you next week.